Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jan Stocking. I am tech lead of the Things Network and CTO of the Things Industries. And I'd like to welcome you to the webinar uh, that is about LoRa 1 1.1. And we're gonna discuss uh, what is new in LoRa 1 uh, 1.1. And um, uh, the topics that, uh, that, I'm like, that I'd like to talk about are, um, are uh, presented in the, in the slides uh, after. Yeah, let's talk about LoRaWAN 1.1. 1. 1. Um, what is new in LoRaWAN 1.1? 1. 1. 1. Um, uh, the specifications have been released um, um, a bit more than a week ago, uh, in October uh, 17. And um, the specifications are actually uh, three different documents. First of all, we have the LoRaWAN 1.1 1. 1 specification. We have the uh, LoRaWAN backend interfaces 1.0 and the regional parameters uh, for LoRaWAN 1.1 1. 1, uh, revision A. Uh, LoRaWAN 1.1, 1. 1, the first document is really about the uh, device to the network server interface. And um, the specification process of 1.1 uh, 1. 1 dates back to early 2015. So this is actually uh, before uh, we announced the Things Network. Uh, that the technical committee was already working on uh, specifying LoRaWAN 1.1. 1. 1. The backend interfaces are about uh, server-to-server interfaces. So network server, application server, joint server, as I will explain a bit later in this presentation. And the regional parameters are uh, mostly about device-to-gateway communication, um, which is configured by the network server. Um, there, are, there, are, there are not a lot of changes in the regional parameters. Uh, it's mostly uh, adopted from 1.0.2, um, uh, but it's, uh, the, the, the version number is the same. And from now on, the, the revision, uh, the new versions will be a new revision number. If you want to request the specifications, uh, you can send an email to Laura Alliance. Um, unfortunately, we cannot disclose them publicly on our website, but you can just send an email and um, the Laura Alliance will send the specifications to you. So let's go to the to the first changes, and actually the most important changes are um, uh, regarding security. Um, we will also discuss Class B support. Uh, there are some new Mac commands. The joint procedure is a bit more enhanced. Uh, there's support for roaming, and finally I will um, uh, talk about the impact for developers. Uh, I have two announcements. One is uh, well, they are both pretty special. First one. Um, is actually only for the people that are watching live, and the second one is uh, is uh, some big news that I'm uh, that I'd like to share. And then finally, we uh, have uh, questions and answers. So again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, ask them on YouTube uh, or in the forum, and then uh, I will address them at the, end of, at the end of the presentation. So first, the security enhancements. LoRa 1 1.1 is addressing addressing some vulnerabilities, and um, uh, primarily three issues that we have seen with 1.0.2. Uh, um, the uh, the uh, uplink uh, and join replay attack and the downlink ACK attack. Um, in LoRa 1 1.1 to, uh, to mitigate for these attacks, um, there, the frame counters may not be reused within the same session. So that means for uh, ABP, for example, that uh, resets are not allowed anymore. And that means that for ABP devices that uh, have um, fixed session keys, that they should uh, uh, they they must store the frame counters on uh, persistent memory, um, and that they uh, survive a power cycle, for example. Um, another change is that the number used once, the defnons and apnons in uh, LoRa 1.0. Apnons is, is renamed to join nons, uh, but it's basically the same thing, um, which is not random. They are not random anymore, but they are now um, incrementing numbers. And uh, they are they should also be stored on persistent memory on the end device. Um, so uh, basically, all end devices need persistent memory. I think that's, that's a big change. Uh, many end devices so far uh, did not uh, support persistent memory, um, and basically from 1.1, this is not supported anymore. Uh, the frame counters are now 32-bit uh, wide. This was already the case, but it was optionally also 16-bit. Um, downlink retransmissions are no longer supported, and that means that for every downlink message, um, the network server will increment the frame count down. 
And um, we actually have two different frame counters now, one for the network and one for the application layer. Uh, and this is because uh, there is no, uh, there, there had to be coordination between the network server and the application server because the network server uh, can initiate uh, downlink traffic uh, that is purely on the Mac layer. So for example, if uh, the ADR commands um, are downlink messages and uh, if the application server wants to schedule uh, application payloads, then it would have to request from the network server what the frame countdown was. So this is a basically a simplification. Uh, um, and finally, which is which is very important to, to mitigate for the downlink egg attack, is that the uplink counter is now part of the message integrity code calculation for uh, the downlink uh, acknowledgement. And this means um, that with uh, in, in LoRaWAN 1.0, for example, uh, you could um, acknowledge uh, any uplink message regardless of uh, which that was. And taking now the specific, the, the frame counter of the uplink message into account, the device knows which uplink frame is actually being acknowledged. And um, in, in, in 1.0, this uh, had some, um, uh, some very nasty side effects um, and actually uh, could uh, break the uh, end device. Um, another thing on the security level is that there are now um, uh, more session keys and um, uh, there is actually also a another shared secret next to the app key that we already know from 1.0. Um, uh, the other shared secret is the network key, and um, from the network key we have three keys that are derived. Um, they look a bit similar to what we had, the network session key, um, uh, but basically we see now that we have three keys, each for a different purpose. Um, so the network session encryption key is being used for the encryption of Mac commands. Uh, and then we have two integrity keys, one for the serving network server and one for the forwarding network server, which I will explain later. Uh, both integrity keys are used for uh, calculating the message integrity code. And the application session key is still there, uh, derived from the app key. Um, if a LoRa 1 1.1 device joins a 1.0 network server, then uh, the network server will use the network key and um, uh, it will uh, use the same session network session keys. Um, and for the end device, uh, there will not be an app key, only the network key. Uh, so the key derivation has, is, is a bit more complex than it was. And the LoRa 1 specification uh, contains a very nice overview of um, how the key derivation works and which root key is being used for which um, session key and also what the primary uh, uses for these session keys. I think this, this is very good to understand the security model uh, of LoRaWAN 1.1. Uh, another major thing in LoRaWAN 1.1 is that um, class B is now uh, specified. And class B is uh, next to class A and class C. Uh, it's, it's very useful. Um, because um, if, if you look at class A, for example, which, which is really end device initiated communication, class C is really network initiated communication, class B is, is really about synchronizing uh, receive windows between the device and the network. And um, this is less power consuming than class C. Um, and uh, because the end device can sleep uh, between uh, the receive windows um, and uh, instead of, for example, class C where the, where the end device is continuously listening, which uh, draws uh, way more power. So class B was um, uh, experimental in LoRaWAN 1.0.2 and uh, now it's, uh, it's specified and the way it basically works is that gateways broadcast uh, a beacon uh, for all the end devices to sync uh, their time and, uh, and the receive slots. And the beacon, the content of the beacon and uh, the default data rate and frequency is now defined in the regional parameters. So the, even the, the frame content of the beacon may, may differ from, uh, from region to region. Um, the network controls the data rate and the frequency. So uh, once there is a communication window with the uh, end device, then the network server can, um, uh, can, uh, can configure a custom data rate and frequency. 
And um, finally, the end device can inform the network server that it is in uh, class B mode uh, through an uplink frame. And this is this is being used, for example, to uh, for in, in the network to select uh, the right gateway uh, for for class B. If you, if you have a moving device that is moving from from different gateways and to other gateways. Um, it, it, it has to inform the network once in a while uh, which gateways it is close to or it has a good signal strength with um, for the network to select that gateway uh, for downlink. Um, another, uh, we in, in LoRaWAN 1.1, we have a few more um, uh, MAC commands. Uh, so um, uh, really on the network layer, uh, commands that the network server can use to configure devices remotely, but also for end devices to uh, to get some information from the network, and um, um, this, uh, for example, the, the ADR uh, limits and delay are now configurable for adaptive data rate. The device can request the absolute time from the network server, and this can, for example, be used for um, logging uh, timestamps. So if you have sensor data and you need the absolute time, uh, to log, for example, on, a, on an SD card, uh, you can use LoRa MAC commands to get the absolute time. Um, there is the um, uh, downlink channel uh, frequency that can be changed for the first receive window. The network can initiate a uh, rejoin, so the network can instruct end devices to uh, rejoin um, start uh, the join procedure, and this can be used for uh, handover. Uh, roaming, as I will come back later, um, to another network, um, uh, or uh, just to 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 get new session keys, and um, uh, there's also some parameters that you can change, and um, uh, also the device can now inform the network server which uh, session keys it has because it can temporarily have an old and new session keys, uh, and there are some um, uh, there are Mac commands for uh, transmission parameters. Um, so, so these these are basically the new the new Mac commands um, that add some functionality, but also are important for uh, roaming. Um, another another uh, thing, another topic that is that is really important in LoRa One and that has been addressed is the join procedure. And uh, in 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 Laura 1 1.0, we saw the the Def UI and the App UI and the App Key. Those were the three things that you need for a device to join the network. Um, in Laura 1 1.1, we have the the Join UI, the Def UI, uh, and the Network Key and the App Key. So you need four things, and here we we basically see that the uh, Join UI replaces the App UI, and the Join UI is used to look up the join server through DNS. So what basically happens is that um, if a network server sees a join request message, it looks up the join server um, with the join UI in a host name um, to look up the join server. And then the join server is responsible for deriving the session keys. And um, so the network key and the app key, the shared secret keys, are only in the join server. And the join server derives the session keys and sends the session keys uh, to the application server and to the network server, as you see on the uh, top right, um, the relation between the join server and the application server and network server. Um, the join server can be operated by a trusted third party, um, so it can it's a, it's a, it's it's a, it's really a service that can be exposed by by companies that are um, uh, that are responsible then for secure storage of uh, shared secret keys, regardless of the network server operator. But of course, um, device manufacturers can host the join server, uh, or um, uh, the network server operator can host the join server, and um, the interfaces uh, for the join server are specified in the backend interfaces document. Um, the, this join procedure allows um, uh, for activating devices on a visiting network. So any network uh, that sees a join request uh, can can uh, contact the uh, join server. Um, and this also allows uh, changing network servers uh, only by changing the configuration of the joint server, because also which network uh, is being used for a particular device 
is a, is a configuration in the joint server. So if you want to change networks uh, and you are using a joint server, you can configure in the joint server that your device uh, now has to use a different network. And then um, on your old network, you can send uh, the force rejoin request that I mentioned before. And then the device will uh, um, will uh, do a join, will send a join request again, and uh, will automatically switch to the other network. And I think this is a very good and nice feature to have in LoRaWAN also for transfer of ownership of uh, end devices. Um, we also, um, and roaming, that's that's a very important topic in LoRaWAN 1.1. And um, here we, we see uh, um, more of a complex uh, um, illustration of what we saw before, where uh, we see the three different roles that a network server can have. Um, so we have the end device, the gateway, and then uh, the network server. But we have a home network server, a serving network server, forwarding network server. We have the application server and, and uh, of course, also the join server. And this is all to support roaming. And there are two, um, two modes of roaming. Uh, first, we have passive roaming, and the other is handover roaming. And passive roaming is already uh, can already be supported in LoRa 1.0 because it for the end device it, it doesn't doesn't really matter. It's just a um, it's just that a uh, network server receives uh, a packet and it forwards it to the network server that this packet uh, should be forwarded to, and that is simply based on the uh, network ID that is part of the public device address. Uh, so that is that is passive roaming, and this can work in two ways. And the interface for this uh, is also specified in the backend interfaces. Um, handover roaming requires LoRaWAN 1.1 because this is really uh, where the device is aware of the fact that it is uh, communicating with a serving network server um, that is not uh, necessarily uh, the home network server. And so the home network server is really where the end device profile is stored. This is this is really the the, the, the master network server for this uh, device. The serving network server is the um, network server where the end device is activated, and this network server manages the entire Mac layer. Uh, and and this is this is for handover roaming, where the device is really on a Mac level communicating with the a serving network server, and a forwarding network server is is a network server where uh, packets are sent and received, uh, and they are being forwarded to the serving network server. And this is for passive roaming. Um, so uh, so yeah, handover roaming requires LoRa 1.1, 1 .1, and um, the way it works is that uh, network servers can actively handover or initiate a handover procedure uh, by sending a Mac command. Uh, but also the device itself uh, can um, rejoin on a regular basis uh, to be activated on a, a other serving network server. Uh, so if a device travels to a different country and there's a different uh, operator active, then um, this would work uh, through LoRaWAN roaming. Um, for developers, and that's you know uh, a lot of people I think that are currently watching are uh, in some way developing solutions or are considering developing solutions for LoRa and LoRa One. Um, uh, we have we have basically impact is mostly on the device side. Um, I think that the number of changes in LoRa One 1.1 is quite significant. Um, and you need a uh, LoRaWAN 1.1 end device stack, so software on the end device to support LoRaWAN 1.1, and you need a compliant module. And um, from what I understand so far is that device makers uh, don't have modules ready yet. Uh, I know they are working on it, but since uh, LoRaWAN 1.1 was re released only um, uh, only uh, yeah like a week ago, um, two weeks ago. Um, I think uh, this is this is still something that uh, that's going to take a while before these stacks are ready, uh, especially before these stacks are certified by the LoRa LoRa Alliance. Um, so th there is time, um, uh, but it's uh, and also I think it's it's important to know that it's it's quite a significant uh, change. 
um, but it's more secure, more capable, and more mobile. So it's it's a very important update. Um, and I think if you are considering uh, big production uh, deployments uh, on a large scale, I think it's good to consider um, uh, LoRaWAN 1.1 uh, on your devices before they ship. Um, LoRa 1.1 regarding compatibility, uh, 1.0 devices really require a 1.0 compatible network server. And um, LoRa 1.1 uh, devices, they will work on a 1.0 network server. So if you already have a new stack on the end device, uh, it will work on an existing LoRa 1 network server. Um, but the 1.0 devices, they they um, yeah they require 1.0 compatible network server, and I think what we see is that network servers will support 1.1.1, uh, and and of course are backwards compatible with previous versions of uh, LoRa One. For the application developers and integrators, um, yeah, you need a compatible network server for both versions. Um, and uh, it's with with uh, what I what I just presented with the uh, joint server and the joint procedure. I think it's it's very good to to consider um, which uh, strategy you will use for your storage of your keys. Uh, whether you want to use use um, a trusted third party joint server, uh, set up a joint server yourself, uh, or if you want to work with uh, the joint server that your uh, network server operator uh, provides. So these are the these are the key uh, changes in uh, LoRaWAN 1.1. Um, we can uh, now see if there are any questions. Ah, I have some questions already. Um, from Johannes, will legacy devices operating on LoRaWAN 1.0 supported for an arbitrary transition period? Um, yes. Yeah, so um, LoRaWAN 1.0 devices, I think they are they are there. Um, uh, to 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 stay, um, many devices have been deployed for for a couple of years, uh, um, and they they will not be updated remotely. Um, firmware updates is also a very important topic, which is which is not really related to LoRa one specification. But um, uh, a lot of devices are out there; they are deployed. They will not be updatable. Um, so uh, 1.0 uh, will definitely be supported also by our uh, version three stack. So um, uh, don't worry, um, we will support both in, in our network server. Another question from um, Morgul is, um, how does LoRaWAN 1.1 work together with older nodes? Yeah, I think that uh, relates to the same question. I think backwards compatibility is, is really important. Uh, I know that other um, partners in, in the LoRa Alliance have also committed to uh, being backwards compatible, and I think that uh, changing specifications uh, should really add functionality and make things more secure for new devices, but it should never break existing deployments. Um, so, um, as, when I speak for myself, when I speak for the Things Network, uh, we will be uh, backwards compatible to 1.0, uh, and um, uh, and so also with uh, devices that are using LoRa 1.0. Um, another question uh, from Etienne. If the communication between network server and joint server is broken, uh, what happens to join requests? Um, that's, um, that's a good question. Uh, actually, if you look at the, um, the, 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 the delay for, for the join accept message, um, probably um, uh, well. Th this is this is five seconds. So the the join request can be is is sent exactly after five seconds, or the, the join accept is sent five seconds after the join request. And so we have five seconds to um, contact the right join server, and the join server can be on a different continent um, because it's it's uh, it's mobile devices on a global network. Uh, five seconds is a lot in in internet terms. Um, but if indeed, if the join server is not available, then uh, the uh, join fails and the device is uh, will need to send uh, more join requests. But um, I think this is also a reason to use a reliable partner if you pick a third party uh, join server, um, that the join server is highly available. Um, 
uh, which also goes, of course, for the network server. Um, okay, another question. Uh, <laughs> why can't the rest of the world be as cool as the Dutch? Well, that's, uh, I don't know, I, I wish I knew the answer. Um, Netherlands is a really nice country to work and live in, and uh, also I think Amsterdam is a great location for a conference. So, um, yeah, uh, if you want to experience, uh, if you want to have a good Dutch experience, then please to come to our conference, uh, first, second, and third of February in Amsterdam. Um, so, um, from Urs on the Elmic uh, stack, Elmic, um, is, I think the original name is Laura Mac in C, which is originally developed by IBM but uh, open source and forked by uh, a few community members also in our, in our, uh, in our community. Um, I'm not sure, um, uh, we don't maintain it, Elmic. Uh, so uh, I already asked uh, a few maintainers of forks of Elmic uh, what their plans are with 1.1. Um, I, uh, I think they will, uh, it's very likely that they will move forward, but I think as with many specifications, um, I think people will wait, developers will wait for the specifications to become final to actually start spending a lot of time in the, in, in the, in, in the, in the end device stack and also know that the changes in LoRaWAN 1.1 are quite significant. So it's, it's quite a lot of work uh, to bring this to Elmic, I, I can imagine. So, um, but f f please feel free to, uh, to reach out to the maintainers of Elmic and of Elmic um, uh, derivatives. A uh, question uh, from uh, Johannes, is there information available on how precise the result of the get time request command is? It's a good question. Um, the, uh, I think the accuracy uh, is, um, well, the, the, the interesting thing with the device uh, uh, time request is that, um, of course, it's just a command and if, there is a retransmission of an uplink frame. So if um, if the device tries a few times to send a message before it gets a result, uh, then you will see that it's uh, the re the response um, and the, uh, it's not going to be deterministic um, uh, when the the request has been received on the server, uh, and this also works the other way around. And which receive window you are in. Um, so I think the accuracy, um, if you if you take good care of the number of retransmissions for uplink, I think the accuracy can be one to two seconds. And if you need more precise um, uh, uh, time stamping, then uh, I believe that uh, you would need to develop something custom on the application uh, level, uh, which is also very well possible, uh, by the way. And there are also some uh, initiatives for that. Um, uh, if, if yeah, the results. I think I need to refer here also to the LoRaWAN specification to get more information about this. Um, question from Julian: uh, Are joint servers uh, distributed? Uh, that's a good question. I think um, in in our case, uh, what we are going to do with uh, the Things Network uh, is that we won't start with uh, distributing joint servers. Um, because I don't believe currently that it's that is really necessary. I think if you make a request response uh, from somewhere else in the world uh, on on internet connections uh, from from server to server data centers, uh, it should be possible to to get a response back uh, within five six hundred milliseconds at most. Um, so that leaves a lot of room for other processing, um, and um, uh, and you're well within the five seconds uh, to deliver the join accept back on the right gateway. So um, a distribution would be would be important uh, when the when the delay becomes an issue, uh, or um, um, of course if you want to have redundancy in, um, in in storage. But the the thing the way it currently works is that because the join servers are looked up by DNS. Um, you uh, only, uh, yeah, you can resolve the a joint UI basically to an IP address. And of course, you can have multiple IP addresses in there. Uh, but I think through DNS, it's pretty hard to, to find the closest uh, joint server. But it's, uh, technically, of course, it's, uh, it's possible. Another question from uh, Sergio. Uh, by when we can expect LoRaWAN 1.1 implemented by device makers? 
Um, yeah, I, I wish I knew. Um, it's. Um, I think what we've seen with uh, 1.0 is that, um, which which was actually the first time that device makers did it. So I think there are a lot of lessons learned, and also there is a basis set on which 1.1 can be implemented. Um, but yeah, um, learning from the past, I think um, it's actually going to take. Uh, um, I think uh, half a year to a year. Uh, before uh, device makers have a stack uh, fully ready and uh, ready for testing. Uh, but I won't be surprised if module makers uh, would have something ready already uh, way earlier, especially for developers uh, to use and to, to test with. Um, but I think it's going to take a, a half a year to a year also to get um, a certification by the LoRa Alliance and to have test houses uh, ready uh, uh, that are uh, able to to test the stack um, and to see everything, if everything is in order. Um, another question, uh, will joint servers allow anonymous connections um, from, from Julian? Um, so um, anyone can query a joint server, but the joint, in the joint server it is configured which a network server and application server um, is uh, configured for the end device. So although every joint network server can um, can query a joint server, the joint server will only send the session keys to the network server uh, that uh, is configured for the end device. Um, it will depend on the roaming agreements um, across uh, between the network servers, uh, to which extent, for example, session keys are sent from the home network server or to which extent the home network server allows session keys to be sent to uh, so-called visiting network servers. So that's a visiting network server is the device is, is visiting a network server and this network server acts as a serving network server. It's, it's very confusing. When I read the spec, I was also, I had to read it uh, uh, twice or three times in order to understand it fully. Um, uh, but um, the, 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 the key thing about joint servers is that joint servers do key derivation and that the joint server sends the keys to the network server and the application server that is configured by the owner of the device. A uh, question from Nicholas. Uh, do you have signed up roaming alliances with other LoRaWAN providers in France, Germany, Belgium or Asia? Um, that's a good question. We, we have been in, in uh, contact with uh, many uh, network server uh, co companies that are building them, so building the technology and also companies that are operating them. And um, currently I uh, have um, no official and public announcements to make about this, um, but uh, hopefully at the Things Conference we can tell more about this um, when we have roaming available and um, then I can tell you with which networks uh, we will enable uh, a traffic exchange. Also, of course, on the public community network, the gateways are not ours. They are owned by you, by the community. So uh, if you want to make your gateway available for other networks, then that will be a choice that you will make. Uh, but in the end, it is, of course, in the interest of everyone to increase coverage and network capacity. So we will make it technically available. Um, but it's not automatically the case that we use each and every gateway for roaming uh, with other networks that are potentially commercial networks. So that's that's eventually always uh, your choice. Um, question from Dennis. Uh, so how long will uh, TTN uh, keep supporting 1.0? Uh, it is it's part of our uh, feed three stack. So 1.0 is it's, it's actually it's uh, compatibility mode. So it's, uh, the, the stack is designed to be 1.1 first, and we are backwards compatible with 1.0, 1.0.1, and 1.0.2. And uh, we will not take that code out. And I think it's very important to keep supporting those devices. And actually, when we start V3, almost from the ground up, um, we are supporting 1.0 devices that are uh, really uh, well, not, not rare, but they are pretty old, but they are there, they are deployed, and we need to support them. Uh, and this is to the extent of Mac commands, but also regional parameters. Um, so let's see, uh, will class B work without GPS on the gateways? Question by Morgul. Uh, I don't think so. 
I think for class B beaconing, the gateways really need to be in sync to send the beacon at the same time. And uh, um, I think it's very important for, uh, for gateways to have a very uh, precise time on the gateway to, uh, to do the timestamping right. So um, I am quite sure that gateways need a GPS uh, for uh, beaconing to work. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, class B is, is support will be very limited, but it will only beaconing can only be done by um, uh, gateways with the GPS. Um, then we have questions, a few questions from uh, Ritesh. Um, first question is um, what is the role uh, on the airtime for get time request? Well, it's basically sorry, it's basically a Mac command that uh, piggybacks on uh, uplink frames, or uh, you can combine multiple Mac commands in one frame. Um, so the, uh, the, the, the airtime, it's not necessarily uh, uh, affected when it comes to a, a particular um, um, uh, Mac command. But of course, uh, like I said, the, the time on air as well as which receive window is being used, um, that is of course affects the accuracy of the timestamp. Um, when can we expect the LoRaWAN library to get new Mac commands? Uh, as soon as we open source our V3 stack, which will be quite soon, um, or already when it's in development, um, uh, at least you get the implementation on the server side, uh, for the client side. Uh, we also depend on device makers and uh, module developers. Uh, and hopefully uh, we will see uh, our partners in the LoRa Alliance to move forward with this and to make uh, LoRa 1.1 1 .1 and device stacks open source. Um, then a the question is, we have class A, B and C devices. Uh, any plan to extend with new type of device? Um, so uh, I, I, have, I have not been in the technical committee long. Uh, for this webinar, I did do some research on the specification process of LoRa 1.1 1 .1, um, in, in, in read through some meeting notes, very interesting. Um, uh, but uh, what I haven't seen is any plans for class D or class E or something like that. So I, I don't really see that happening in the short term. I think with class A, B and C, uh, we can cover uh, almost all the use cases uh, for, for long range, low power IoT. Uh, final question from uh, Ritesh is, uh, any idea for custom application for time sync network using new Mac events? Yeah, there are, um, uh, you, you can think of an application extension on top of uh, uh, LoRa 1, uh, which uh, gives you accurate uh, uh, timestamps um, in out of band. And um, you can, of course, tweak the Mac layer a little bit to make this more accurate. For example, uh, you can disable uh, retransmissions of uplink um, and uh, you can check whether the response has been received in the RX1 or an RX2. If it's RX2, you know what the delay is. So you can, you can, you can do that on the application layer to make everything uh, way more accurate. Uh, and then again, the question is also how much accuracy do you need uh, on the end device? Um, then we have a question from Thomas. Um, how do we separate LoRaWAN 1.1 from LoRaWAN 1.0 messages on reception? Uh, the major version is still one as far as I can tell. Yeah, that's true. Um, the, um, uh, when uh, provisioning a device, it's important that the uh, version of LoRa 1 is also configured. And it's not only the version of the uh, of the, the, the LoRa 1 specification, but also the, the revision of the regional parameters. Those two things need to be um, uh, configured in the device registry. And this is also something that we will support uh, in LoRa 1, uh, in our feed 3 stack, um, where we um, uh, allow you to configure the uh, LoRa 1 version and also the uh, regional parameters revision. So that's something that you that you need uh, to configure as a solution maker. Um, for the end device to know which um, uh, network server version uh, it's, uh, it's communicating with, there is a bit uh, in the join accept message um, that indicates whether uh, the uh, network server 
uh, supports uh, 1.0 or 1.1, uh, and that is important for the key derivation. Uh, so that the end device, even if it's 1.1, knows that it's on a 1.0 network server and that it has to um, use the old uh, algorithm for uh, key derivation. All right, so the, these are the questions. Um, um, well, I uh, think I went through all of them. Uh, very good questions, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for joining, uh, for your time. Um, uh, uh, looking forward to see you again uh, uh, in the next webinar. We will probably do uh, one more uh, about uh, the V3 stack, and also we have a webinar planned uh, on firmware updates, uh, which we'll, uh, we will announce uh, soon, which is also a very important topic. So uh, for now, thanks. Uh, have a nice day, have a good evening, and hope to see you at the Things Conference in February. Goodbye.